Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm here with Dr. Christian Miller. He is the A.C. Reed Professor of Philosophy at Wake Forest University in the U.S. His research is primarily in contemporary ethics and philosophy of religion. He is also the author of three books, including Moral Character and Empirical Theory, Character and Moral Psychology, and the most recent one, The Character Gap, How Good Are We? So, Dr. Miller, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's great to be with you. I look forward to our conversation. Oh, it's a pleasure. Okay, so in your book, your most recent one, you state uh, in several po at several points that we as humans are very morally flawed. But for you to say this, where do you come from from a moral standpoint? Are you a moral absolutist or or not? Yes, um, so that's a good place to begin. Uh, I, I I have my own personal view, and then I also have what I try to do in the book, and those are different. Uh, so let me start with my own personal views, and then I'll explain what I was my strategy in the book. Uh, my own personal view is that there is an objective morality. Uh, philosophers would say it's call this an objectivist position or a more realist position. Mm -hmm. And so I, I am not very sympathetic to either a relativist position or a, a uh, nihilist or completely uh, kind of rejecting morality position. So let me explain those terms a little bit for those who are uh, not as familiar with them. Sure. So on, on an objectivist position, there is uh, there are objective truths and objective facts about morality that exist independent of human beings. They weren't created by human beings. We can't change uh, those facts, even if we wanted to. They're kind of set in place. And our, uh, our kind of responsibility epistemically is to try and learn what those facts and truths are and then morally conform our behavior to them. Uh, on a relativist position instead, the typical way that's understood is that human beings, either individually or as a society, construct morality. So we're, we are the authors of morality, so I can have my moral code and that's what's morally right for me and you have your moral code and that's what's morally right for you or we can do that at a societal cultural level and there's no further truth there's no higher authority to adjudicate between these different outlooks so that's my approach and then there's a lot more to be said about where that objective morality comes from does it come from an objective am I a, a, a higher divine being or a, a supernatural source does it just exist on its own we could get into those debates if you like but strategically in the paper, I mean, in, the, in, the, in my book, uh, The Character Gap, I really did not want to get into the nitty gritty of those kind of debates in contemporary ethics, precisely because I didn't want to alienate my readers. I didn't want them to think, oh, I have to buy into all this background material, that this, this big overarching worldview or metaphysical framework in order to accept what this author says. So I actually tried to keep it as minimal and as thin as possible. Uh, so to reach as, as broad an audience as I could. Mm -hmm. Very well. Okay, and so uh, how do we decide or how do we find what is virtuous and what is vicious or what is good and what is bad? Right, and those are two different things. So uh, you know, within the ethics, there are three families of concepts uh, typically distinguished. There are uh, what are called axiological concepts. Those are concepts of good and bad. There are the virtue concepts and vice concepts, broadly speaking, the character concepts. And then there are the what are called deontological concepts. So I'm sorry for all the, the terminology, but uh, so there are concepts having to do with good and bad, concepts having to do with virtue and vice, and concepts having to do with obligation, duty, right and wrong. And so there are uh, interesting questions about how we find out each of those uh, concepts and, and figure out the objective truth for each of them. Let's uh, maybe just start with the case of the virtue, since that's the main focus of my research. And, you know, we, we can think about, well, how do I know whether something is a virtue or not? That's one question we might have. Another question we might have is, OK, I know this is a virtue. How do I figure out what I'm supposed to do in a particular instance? So there are actually, a, we want to distinguish a variety of different questions, even with respect to character. So again, to, to mention them, first of all, how do I know whether this character trait like humility uh, or pride is a virtue or a vice? How do I just, how do I tell that? Secondly, 
suppose I, you know, I'm, I'm confident that humility is a virtue. How do I then discern in a given situation at a, you know, at a, at a, at a, at a meeting in the office or at home or at a party, what the humble thing is to do? So uh, on the, the first set of questions, again, in my, uh, my writings for a popular audience, I'm trying to be strategic and not have to get you to buy into, say, um, a supernatural foundation and a list of virtues that's been put in place by God or a evolutionary perspective, which says the virtues are only those which are conducive to our long term, you know, uh, evolutionary f uh, flourishing. What I just do is mainly rely on widely accepted virtues. Uh, in other words, ones where I don't think there's going to be much controversy. So examples like honesty. Um, yeah, I think you ask most people, is honesty a good thing? Is it a virtue? Is it a character trait we should cultivate? You know, I, I don't think I need to say much to justify the answer being yes. Uh, so that's, that's again, more just kind of appealing to widely held uh, uh, virtues and then trying to not focus on ones where there's more controversy, just strategically for writing it for a popular audience. Now, on the second issue about well, how do we discern in a given instance what the virtuous thing to do is? Again, I'll, I'll reiterate what I just said. I'm going to rely on kind of widely held uh, examples and situations where it's pretty clear. So, you know, in a, in a case where someone asked me, um, you know, where were you last night? It's pretty clear what the honest thing to do is, is to tell the truth. Right? And there's not going to be much controversy about that. But there is, you know, deeper philosophical issues here. I don't want to mean, I don't mean to just avoid these deeper philosophical issues. Uh, so, you know, if you think um, honesty is important and you're trying to figure out what should I do in this given situation, uh, you could go in a variety of different routes. You could, uh, for example, go to Kant's morality and think about uh, the, the categorical imperative. What if everyone were to tell a lie? What would the world be like in that kind of situation? You could go to a more utilitarian approach and think about, well, it would be we'd be maximizing overall happiness if we were to tell a lie in this kind of situation. You could go to a, a more uh, a supernatural approach and think about, is telling a lie in accordance with God's commandments or God's will or whatnot? And those are great debates, um, but again, uh, not ones I really wanted to get into uh, for this particular book. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. And the thing that I find very interesting about your book is that uh, at several points in it, you resort to and refer to uh, psychological experiments, which allow for us to better understand uh, how our morality works and perhaps also our biases, our innate biases that we have when we deal with other people and behave socially and perhaps the things that tweak our minds into preferring certain patterns or be of behavior or, or others so uh, you accept a naturalistic approach to also studying how our mind works and the value that that has for yes. mor moral philosophy right i do um up to a point uh so i want to be careful about i think what psychology can help us with and what it can't help us with sure. so uh in my research for the last 10 years, I've been, uh, I've been a philosopher, I should say. I'm not a trained psychologist. I don't have a PhD in psychology. I try to kind of learn as much as I can on my own. And what I've been using psychology to do is to get a better picture of how I think most people are put together today when it comes to matters of morality and specifically moral character. Uh, what are, you know, my, the title of my book is The Character Gap, How Good Are We? So as kind of as a matter of fact, so when it comes to these more factual questions about, you know, how do people tend to behave in a variety of different circumstances and what is their underlying motivation tend to be? And so more deeply, what is their uh, fundamental psychology uh, look like when it comes to moral matters? Psychology can be extremely valuable and helpful, but only up to a point. What psychology can't do for us is tell us how we should be. The, the more normal, normative or ethical claims. So this is a, a this is no you know, big discovery. This is a very familiar point that's uh, been emphasized by many others. Uh, so psychology can tell me how do people tend to behave. It can't tell me how people should behave. It can tell me uh, are people behaving in a way that I would expect of a virtuous person, but it can't tell me 
what is it to be a virtuous person in the first place? So uh, my research is interdisciplinary in the sense that I get the empirical data from psychology and then I bring to bear the more normative and ethical perspective coming from philosophy. So how are we from psychology? How should we be from uh, philosophy? And then combine the two to arrive at a conclusion about how well we're doing today. Mm -hmm. And do you think that in this case, psychology also helps us to understand in what ways we are flawed as well and perhaps how we could improve them? And yeah. not, not, not in terms of being prescriptive, but just telling us about uh, in what ways we tend to fall morally and how we could improve them. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, again, up to a point, though. Um, so it can... Uh, you can design a clever psychology experiment. I can give you some examples if you want to get into some of the actual experiments. Uh, you design a clever psychology experiment that discloses to us something new about how human beings tend to behave that we didn't appreciate before. For instance, how people tend to behave in groups, group contexts, when emergency is going on. Uh, we might predict that people would tend to still uh, address the emergency or rise to the challenge if someone's screaming in pain or not, but it turns out, and I can say more about this if you like, that people don't do so if others in the group are not uh, coming to the assistance of that person in need. So we learn something new about a psychological tendency we might not have appreciated before. And then that's very helpful to know. And then we can devise different strategies for trying to address that tendency. If it's a tendency that we think is morally reprehensible or morally, uh, you know, not virtuous, and we want to help people overcome that tendency, or at least uh, you know diminish it. Then we can devise these strategies and test them, of course. Uh, but that's all uh, done against a background assumption of what is good and what is bad, and what is virtuous and what is vicious. So we're already assuming, okay, this tendency is a bad tendency. It's something that we should work against, that we should strive to overcome. That's not something that psychology can tell us. That's something that philosophy is, uh, is, is importing and using to judge that tendency. And so again, it's a cooperative exercise between philosophy and psychology where each discipline by itself can't uh, resolve these issues. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in your book, you refer to the fact that perhaps if we use these psychological experiments uh, to devise ways to tweak our minds into behaving more according to what we consider to be good behavior, that, that perhaps just um, moving toward that through things like guilt and embarrassment and by changing our environments that that by itself is not enough because perhaps people are not uh, if they are manipulated let's say to behave in a morally good way but uh, they don't have the proper intentions or motivations then that, that would not be enough that's that's correct so uh, here we should probably back up at one step and Mm -hmm. I should explain how I'm thinking about virtues. Uh, I have a kind of an Aristotelian approach to virtues where it's not enough just to behave a certain way, even if the behavior is admirable, very admirable. And even if the behavior is uh, consistent over time and consistent across a variety of situations, that, it, that those are all necessary features of being virtuous, but they're not sufficient uh, by themselves. In addition, one needs to have appropriate virtuous motivation behind the behavior. So to make that a little bit more concrete, uh, someone who's helping others, not just once, but in a variety of circumstances, mm -hmm. and they're doing it not just in a given week, but consistently over time, week in and week out, uh, that person on the outside looks like a compassionate person. So externally, their behavior is the behavior I would expect of a compassionate person. But internally, we don't know yet until we understand what that person's underlying motivation is like. If it's self-interested motivation, say, to use your uh, your, your examples, uh, guilt relief motivation. So this person is helping just to relieve guilty feelings or just to avoid feeling guilty feelings in the future or to use some other examples uh, to alleviate feelings of embarrassment uh, or very different example to earn rewards in the afterlife. All these kinds of egoistic or self-interested motivations to me, 
are not virtuous motivation, not the motivations I would expect of a compassionate person. And so if that's the motivational story, even though the behavior is so admirable, that would not be sufficient uh, for having the virtue of compassion. So to answer your question now, more with that background in mind, where I'm coming from and how I think about virtues from this, more, like I said, more Aristotelian framework, uh, you're right. Um, you can, if you want to get people to behave better, you can come up with all kinds of interesting uh, manipulations. You can change their environment in certain ways to get them to be exposed to some some better influences and avoid some less uh, positive influences. But if that's having an impact purely at the behavioral level and not doing much at the psychological underlying motivational level to foster virtuous motivation, it's not enough to thereby to uh, develop the virtues. Mm -hmm. And why is that so? Is just because if people are just behaving uh, in ways that are influenced by the way their environments are constructed, that then perhaps if they are put in different circumstances, then per uh, because they are not properly motivated to uh, behave in a good way just for the sake of it, then they might easily change their behavior. Is, is that the reason why that is yeah. so important? Well, I guess we just need to get a little bit more detail. Um, so let me let me maybe give you a, a study to, to help it make it more concrete too. Uh, one interesting study that's actually been replicated, and there's a I'm sure many of your listeners know that there's a replication crisis going on in psychology right now, but here's a study that has been successfully replicated. In a control environment, in a shopping mall, shoppers would walk past, past clothing stores and then have an opportunity to help a few minutes later. And this was the control environment, so that there's nothing really special about this setup. The results found that about 10 to 15% of shoppers would do the helping task. So you say, well, Okay, following your line of reasoning, could we get them to behave better? You know, how could we get people to behave better in shopping malls? Well, here's uh, an interesting way. And this was part of the study too. In the experimental group, same shopping mall, same helping task, different participants, and these participants are ones who had walked past Mrs. Fields cookies or Cinnabons. I don't know how familiar those are, um, you know, outside of the U.S., but those are places where the, the fragrance is very, very um, alluring, very, you know, uh, it, it's, it's cookies and good smells and you just put in a really good mood. Um, so, okay, that's the only change. Same helping task then follows a few minutes later. Greater than 60% of participants in this setup helped. So about 10% in one situation, about 60% in another situation where the only difference was the presence of the good smell. So now to go back to your, your line of questioning, well, okay, we got better behavior. That's a plus, right? I mean, and so I, I'm not down, I'm not criticizing that, that's great. We want better behavior, we want people to, to be more helpful than they would otherwise be. But are we getting virtue? Are we getting compassion? Well, what's the underlying psychological story? We don't know for sure, what, you know, to explain the, the difference in the behavior. We don't know for sure, but the leading explanation, it could be, could be mistaken, but the leading one is that the smells put people in a good mood. People want to maintain their good moods. Helping is seen as a way to, to maintain a good mood. And lo and behold, a few minutes later, here comes an opportunity to help. So the helping opportunity is treated purely instrumentally as a way to maintain a good mood and not as... Uh, as we would expect it for a compassionate person, as a way to help someone else for his or her own sake. So it's self-interested, it's egoistic, not altruistic, and so therefore not virtuous. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, to sum it up, um, yeah, you could, you could change people's environment in all kinds of ways. That doesn't th thereby guarantee that you're going to be fostering virtue. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what are some of the main findings in terms of the ways by which humans are morally flawed? And perhaps now you could complement the answer by giving a, a, a couple more examples of uh, psychological studies or experiments that you talk about in your book. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so let me um, give you first a little bit of background. Uh, my overall picture is one of mixed character, so I don't want to... Uh, although we're going to talk about the flaws, uh, I really want to drive home the theme that I'm not saying that we are vicious or you know kind of awful, wretched people. 
I'm, uh, I, I want to give a really balanced picture here, which is, I think, what the studies reveal. On the negative side, though, uh, it's easier to go there. There are lots of um, studies going back to the 1960s that are quite famous that have gotten a lot of attention. Uh, let me mention just a couple. One I've already alluded to has to do with groups and helping. So in the late 1960s, there was this uh, kind of study where you would come into a room, you would be given some papers to fill out a survey. A few minutes later, a stranger you don't know at all would come into the room and have the same papers and we'd be sitting at the table filling out this, the papers just like you are. The person in charge would then leave, go to the next room. A few minutes later, you would hear a big crash and she would yell things like, ouch, ouch, my leg, my leg, I can't get up, ouch, this hurts so much. And ordinarily people would think, you know, oh, that's an emergency, I better help. And if I was in that situation, I would help. Mm -hmm. Well, it really depends upon whether that stranger with you helps or not. If that stranger in the same room with you does nothing, it's very likely you will do nothing yourself as well. In fact, in that setup, only 7% of the participants did anything to help when they heard that emergency. Yes, just to interrupt you there, that's called the bystander effect, right? That's right, that's right. And so that was uh, one version of it that was studied very early on. It's now been replicated many times. There are also many other versions of it. And it's also something that we see every year in the news where this is actually kind of acted out or carried out in real life. So it's, it's very um, practical and applicable, unfortunately, you know, sadly. Um, but we see this all the time. In fact, I begin the book by using a real life example of this where at a store, uh, someone collapses on the aisle that won't spend much time on it, but just collapses in an aisle of a shopping store and people just step over his body or turn the other direction rather than helping him. So this is this is a real world phenomenon that's really important to address. I'll give you, uh, in the interest of time, one other example. So that's that was an example of lack of helping, failing to help someone. Let's go uh, in a very different direction. I'm a professor. You know, I uh, I'm giving an exam tomorrow to my students. So I you know worry a lot about cheating and honesty and these kind of things. And you know, I I can't just assume that my students are always going to be honest, especially when I read studies like this one. Uh, this is a much more recent study done in the last 10 years, where in a control group, people are given 20 problems. They're told you're gonna get paid 50 cents US uh, per correct answer. They take the test, they turn it in, the person in charge grades it, and they're paid accordingly. So there's no opportunity to cheat at all. It's cut and dry. Uh, in one version of this, they get about seven correct answers out of 20 on average, so they get paid accordingly. The interesting variation though is, what about another group of participants who given the same test, 20 problems, same as sent out 50 cents per correct answer, is then also told you will be the one to grade the test. Not the experimenter, you grade the test, then you shred all your materials and just report to us how many questions you got correct. So they know there's a 100% chance uh, that they could cheat if they wanted to and get away with it, no questions asked. They don't have to cheat, there's no pressure to, but they have that option available to them. Lo and behold, as a group, this uh, group gets 14 correct, in quotation marks, uh, answers compared to the seven in the control group. But while it could be that this group is so much smarter, I don't wanna say that, uh, I don't think that's very likely, the much more likely explanation is that this group saw an opportunity to cheat and took advantage of it, and that's another very different example of not the best side of our character. Mm -hmm. Right. So at a certain point in your book, you also say that uh, if people were to behave in a morally good way, just because by doing so they feel good, that would also not be enough. But I mean, it is also the case that uh, if people are properly motivated to behave in a good way but just by the sake of it, then at least we get the byproduct of feeling good by doing so, right? And that's not a problem. Not a problem at all. So I really want to distinguish between a goal and a byproduct using your language. Uh, it's, it's very helpful. Uh, so it's one thing to be motivated as your goal by your self-interest by getting, say, for example, pleasure for yourself. 
if that's your goal, you're just doing it to get pleasure for yourself, that's egoistic, and that's not going to be compatible with virtuous motivation. However, um, that could, I think it's a danger here. To Some people are going to come away with the impression, therefore, a virtuous life is a very unhappy life. It's a miserable life. You're just doing things for others or doing things because it's the right thing, and you're not benefiting at all yourself. And so it's very hard to even inspire people to go down this path in the first place. But wait, wait a minute. Your, your point uh, is very apt and very important to keep in mind. Even if it's not your goal, your own pleasure or your happiness or whatever we want to talk about here, it can still be a byproduct, a side effect, right? So it comes, it can come along for the ride. So I, you know, I help a person across the street. Why? Because I care about that person, and you know that person needs some help across the street. But afterwards, I also feel good about myself, and I'm, I'm kind of satisfied. That I did this. That wasn't my goal is to get that satisfaction, but I, I experienced that satisfaction afterwards, and that's completely fine and compatible with being a virtuous person. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and what do you think? What is your opinion about utilitarian approaches to ethics? That is, um, knowing the best ways to bring happiness to the greatest number of people possible. W what do you think about yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. So that. That would take us uh, in a in a broader direction here, which um, I'm I'm just finishing up teaching ethics uh, here at Wake Forest, and so we spend about a month uh, wrestling with utilitarianism. I don't in the in my research on character try to get into that too much because again I don't want to uh, take a stand in a way that would uh, alienate listeners and readers. My my own view is that um, first of all, utilitarianism is a is a huge family of views. Uh, there's no one specific position. There's act utilitarianism. There's rule utilitarianism. There are all these very clever, newfangled versions out there. If we're just focusing initially on the traditional view, so an act is obligatory if and only if uh, it maximizes, say, um, pleasure more than any other action that the agent could perform in the circumstances. So I've, I could perform five actions, and I have to think about, or uh, You know, there is a truth about which action would bring about more pleasure than any other, other action. So one of them does more so than the other four. Then that's the one I'm obligated to perform. Thinking about that version for the moment, um, I have a number of concerns about that version. So the short answer is I don't. I'm not a fan. The longer answer is well, why not? What What are my reservations? Uh, and I I'll give you a couple. It would take a while to to go through all of them. Um, one is. The, just the, the standard epistemic worry. Uh, the, so just the, how are we supposed to know what maximizes pleasure? It's not my pleasure. That's egoism. It maximizes pleasure in general, which would include other people, would also include animals, if there are any implications for animals and other beings who can experience pleasure and pain. And so there's this, this traditional epistemic worry about, well, I have no idea what implications my actions are going to have on others' pleasure in the short run as well as the long run. You know, five minutes from now, 50 minutes from now, 50 people there in responses, but and we can go down that path if you want, but just to give you an initial answer. Um, I'm also quite worried about some of the traditional counterexamples or problem cases. Uh, examples like the following, the medical sacrifice example. So uh, if you're a doctor in a remote village and you have uh, five patients who are desperately in need of organ transplants and they each need a different organ, and here's uh, someone who's homeless who's coming in for a routine checkup, and you know that this person doesn't have any friends or family members, and you could easily kill this person as a doctor and harvest their organs and give you know, each one to the five who are waiting for the organs, thereby saving their lives, but killing the homeless person in the process. You could make an argument. Again, I know the responses. I'm, I'm well, well aware of the back and forth about this. But initially, at least, it looks like you could make an argument that are on a utilitarian grounds, it's obligatory, not just optional, or you have you could do that, permissible, but even morally obligatory for you as a doctor to kill the, the homeless person. And that I find uh, morally reprehensible and too steep a price to pay to be a utilitarian. So those are two worries, and I could mention others if we if we had time.
Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, but just to get more specific about the recent movement that is also an utilitarian one, that is the effective altruism movement, and pr probably you are aware of it. But uh, so th there is, I guess, that from all of what you just said, there's two things. The most important one for you is uh, how and why people are motivated to perform good actions. And the other side of it is the results that we get from those same actions. But ju just, uh, just leaving aside the question about motivation for a few seconds, mm. le let's just assume that people are motivated for good reasons. Would you say that uh, a thing that, like the effective altruism movement, because it helps people uh, to, uh, um, to, uh, to use their resources in a more effective way to, per to perhaps put them into that or that organization that is more effective in tackling the problem at hand that that also could have some value. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, definitely could have some value. Yeah. Um, and I guess we need to, you know, I'm, uh, I'm someone who's kind of slow and likes to go through kind of step by step carefully. Uh, sure. If if we we have to first kind of define what the movement is and then we have to see uh, what the underlying normative ethical commitments are. So, for example, do I have to accept utilitarianism in order to support the effective altruism movement? If I do have to accept utilitarianism, then, then that's going to be a problem for me. If I don't, if I could be, for example, a virtue ethicist instead and think, you know, virtues are really important, including one virtue, compassion. And, and I think part of what uh, compassion could involve is helping people not only close near, near to me, but also people who are far away from me, both geographically and socioeconomically, then uh, then I feel much more comfortable, uh, you know, supporting the effective altruism movement. And then we also, so that's one question. Do I have to buy into a particular ethical theory? I don't, I don't think I do, but if I do, then I'm going to be worried. Mm -hmm. uh, second question would be, well, how far do I have to take it? Do I have to take it as far as, say, Peter Singer wants to take it in his famous paper, Fame and Affluence and Morality, the one that that you know, just about everyone in philosophy has read, and it's been arguably the most famous influential paper in the last 50 years. Well, if that's uh, how far I have to take it, just I'm going to be worried too. How far is that? Well, just for those who have, of your listeners who have not read that paper, in that paper, Singer argues that we are morally required to donate up until the point at which we ourselves need famine relief or assistance from charity organizations. So it's an extremely demanding form of morality. Uh, and if that's what effective altruism commits me to, then I'm going to be worried again. But I don't think it has to commit me to that either. So I, I want to be slow here. I want to be careful and see what I'm committing to and what I'm not committing to. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now to move on to another question. Uh, what did you conclude to be the best ways to improve our own moral character through your philosophical and psychological inquiry, inquiries, let's say? Yeah, great. Um, so in the, the book is structured like this. Uh, in the first part of it, I just define character and virtue. It gives some background. Why is character important? In the middle part of it, I look at the empirical data and c draw a conclusion about how good or bad are we. And then in the third part, I talk about character improvements. But it's important that that p part piggybacks on the second part. And of course, the second part has to piggyback on the first part. Why? Because if we are already virtuous to begin with, then there's less interest and less need to, uh, you know, less importance to think about character improvement if, we're, if that's where we are to begin with. So by the end of the second part of the book, I've concluded that we have a mixed character. We have some aspects of our character which are positive, some aspects of our character which are, are not positive. So we don't have enough positivity to be virtuous. We don't have enough negativity to be vicious. We're somewhere in this middle. So if I had ended the book right there, I think that would have been, I could have done that. It could have been an interesting book, maybe, but also a little bit discouraging to say, here, here's how we are. See you later. You know, go, go deal with that. Um, so what I did instead was added on three more chapters talking about how to improve character. The first one says, uh, here are some strategies that are out there, which I don't think are very uh, uh, helpful or not very promising. And so I, if you want to get into them, we can, but I, I'll set them aside. The second uh, chapter in the section talks about strategies which I do think are positive, helpful, show some promise. 
And in the last chapter, I switch from a secular perspective to a more religious perspective and look at the relationship between character improvement and religion. So in that chapter on strategies which show some promise, I'll mention a couple of, we can go into as much detail as you like, but at least let me, let me throw two of them out there and we can talk about more if you want. Mm -hmm. One is uh, good role models, the impact of good moral role models, that is, here. And these can be people who are close to you in your life. They can be a family member. They could be a neighbor or an employee or whoever who, who uh, you see on a day-to-day -day basis. They could also be people in history going back in time. So, uh, you know, in America, we often celebrate people like Abraham Lincoln. Uh, there could be other role models like Gandhi, um, Jesus, and other examples like that. They could also be fictional role models. They don't have to be uh, actual people. They could be people like um, characters in really impactful novels who show a kind of way of living that can be inspiring to us. Because the ultimate idea here is you look to these role models and you see how exemplary they are, so <clears throat> how admirable they are, not on the basis of their achievements or their sports prowess or, or their artistic accomplishments or anything like this, but it'd be on the basis of what incredibly good people they were, at least in some area of their lives. So we admire them. And that's not all, though. We, we admire them, which leads us to want to emulate them, to become more like them. But the, the psychologist height is called the emotion of ele elevation, uh, which can inspire us to have our lives better reflect what their lives are like. And so that's the idea. And I can uh, dive into that more if you like, but just to throw that idea out there. And then a second idea I'll throw out there uh, has to do with more reminders. So it's uh, easy enough to go on a certain path in your life and kind of have that path become routine. And sometimes those paths are not the best for developing a good character. And so more, more reminders can come along and help restore to us a better perspective on life. Those could be things like more reminders can be uh, a bracelet or uh, a wristband. Uh, those were popular in America for quite a while. Uh, they could be a reading that you start your day with every day. Uh, they could be uh, someone uh, programming their phone to send them text messages throughout the day to serve as more reminders. And this has been uh, shown to have an interesting impact in the psychology literature in a way that we can tie into our earlier discussion. So earlier we were talking about the cheating literature and how there are these studies which found that if you have the opportunity to grade your own test, uh, that you're much more likely to cheat than if someone who's in charge grades the test for you. Seven correct answers versus 14 in quotes uh, in the opportunity to shred your answer key and grade the test yourself. Well, there's a third variation where before the participants were given the test that they were going to grade themselves, they were given a moral reminder. In one instance, it was recall the Ten Commandments. In another instance, it was sign your university's honor code. The point is less about the details of the reminder as it is the fact that it was a reminder, reminding people of what's most important, morally speaking. Well, lo and behold, subsequently, even though they had a chance to cheat and get away with it, no questions asked, the average performance was back down to a seven or as it's similar to it as it was in the control situation. So to sum up, uh, looking to uh, exemplars and moral heroes is one strategy. Moral reminders is another strategy. And I, if, if there's time, I'll, I'll mention one third one. Um, and that's what I call getting the word out, which basically means get, developing a better understanding of yourself and of ourselves. And understanding some of these biases, that use your the terminology you nicely introduced, and some of these dispositions and tendencies we have, which can keep us uh, from being virtuous people, which can lead us astray. So to uh, make that a little bit more concrete, go back to a, another earlier discussion we had with the group effect and how often we are so influenced by whether others in our environment help or not. Most of us had no idea about that. And it was really eye-opening when that research came along, this bystander effect or, or group effect. And you know, you ask people before these experiments were done, what would you do? They said, of course I would help. Now, once the, uh, the research is getting out there more, people are, you know, and they're aware of it, people are more cautious to say, 
Well, you know, it really depends. Would I help if I'm by myself versus would I help in a group? Well, maybe if I'm in a group, I need to think that uh, there might be some inclinations, and in particular, a fear of embarrassment, which is central to the story of what's going on, that might keep me from helping others when others are not uh, themselves uh, joining me in the task. So learning more about ourselves, learning about, for example, the powerful role of fear of embarrassment, and then trying to curb that influence, to not care as much about whether I would embarrass myself in front of others, and learning to care more about the suffering of others and have that take greater priority in my mind over fear of embarrassment. That's the third strategy, which I call, again, getting the word out. So those are three strategies that I think are very promising. Mm -hmm. Okay, very well. So if we have the time, I will ask you a follow-up question about that, but just in the interest of time, because we have to keep this under 60 minutes, I would like to ask you about the part where you talk about religion as mm -hmm. being another source that people can use to develop their moral character, let's say. And, mm -hmm. and I want to ask you about that because my channel is focused more on the sciences, philosophy as well. But uh, as you might understand, we, uh, here we are very focused on naturalistic approaches and things like that. So mm -hmm. I would I would like to ask you, uh, how do you look at religion as an influence to morality, let's say? Do, and do, uh, how do you look at uh, God? Do, do you think that it's important to look at him, let's say, as a metaphysical entity that really exists? Or is it enough to have him as a sort of ideal to look up to and to direct our moral behavior in accordance to, let's say. Yeah, yeah great. So I, I can say a lot here, and maybe you'll need to cut me off at some point if you want to. That's perfectly fine. Uh, let me first say that the discussion of religion and God specifically can enter into morality in all kinds of ways. For example, at our, the beginning of our conversation, it can enter into the discussion of the foundations of morality or metaethics, and it can... Uh, serve as a potential basis for an objective morality. So there's objective morality which exists because God or supernatural being put that mor objective morality into place. So that's one way it can enter in. Let's, let's put that to one side, though. Uh, in my last chapter, I instead look at another connection, which is uh, do religions have something positive to contribute to the topic of character improvement and development? Because after all, that's what I'm doing in this last part of the book. And I make it very clear from the start that I'm in no way arguing that one has to be religious to be moral, nor is it necessary to be religious in order to be, become a virtuous person. And so to put that differently, you can be a virtuous person and be an atheist or agnostic, and I'm perfectly fine with that. I'm only looking to these religions to see if they have some additional contributions to make. I mean, after all, uh, most people throughout history purport to be religious. Uh, religions have had lots to write about, uh, lots to say about character. So I think we should at least pay attention to it, look at, look at it, even if at the end of the day, we don't think it's very helpful. Uh, I think it's, it's intellectually irresponsible to not least investigate and consider it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do in that, that last chapter. And in that chapter, and specifically, I uh, focus on Christianity. Again, not to say that you have to be a Christian or that Christianity has any better contribution to make to virtue or morality, but just to make the discussion specific and focused rather than doing what I think would be a not very good job of going, you know, Confucianism for five pages, Taoism for five pages, Islam for five pages, Judaism for five pages, Christianity for five, five pages. I think that would be so superficial that it would be, I think, pretty much worthless. So I got it into Christianity a little bit in this chapter, uh, uh, often saying that the insights that are uh, explored in Christianity can carry over to Judaism and Islam and other religions as well. So now to tackle your question more specifically, um, do I think, first of all, that, say, uh, a, a theistic approach to religion or a Western uh, you know, approach to religion has something positive to contribute to character development? And then secondly, uh, would it matter if we swapped out an actual being for a fictional being or an ideal being? So on the first part of that, um, I do think there are positive contributions to make. But it's a very hard to establish that empirically. So in this chapter, I, I actually go over for about 10 pages some of, of the empirical data linking things like 
charity work, volunteering, donations, criminal behavior, uh, subjective well-being, a number of different dimensions. There's empirical work linking those things to measures of religiosity. Things like how often do you go to a, a religious service or how often do you pray or how, or to, how often do you pray or how uh, strongly do you believe in a divine being? And what this data suggests, and this is you know, speaking to your naturalism here, uh, and this is data from psychology, this is data from sociology, this is data from economics, is that there is a, a significant correlation. So uh, as attendance at services goes up, charity donations tend to go up. Or as um, frequency of prayer goes up, uh, volunteering tends to go up. But I also note a couple of caveats or limitations. One, it's just correlational. It's not causal. So it's not establishing what would be most helpful, which would be a causal relationship, you, you know, whatever that relationship is. We just have correlations. And then two, uh, even if it turns out to be causal, we don't get much insight into the motivation. So nicely connecting again to another aspect of our earlier discussion, this data doesn't tell us much about underlying motivation and whether uh, religious people have a more virtuous motivation for engaging these actions or not. Okay, so there's that, some things to say there. Then on the other point about fictional versus real, and real, I mean, depends on what your perspective is, but for, for Christians, or they think God is real, for atheists, of course, they don't think God is real. So um, from a Christian perspective, they think there is this metaphysical entity, divine being who actually exists outside of uh, this universe. If um, that was switched or swapped with a view where it's just a fictional being, so according to the, the religious fiction, God exists, or it's just an idealized being, a hypothetical being, would that have as much of an impact? And again, it's going to depend on what we're talking about, impact on what, right? So would it have as much of an impact on serving as a basis for an objective morality? And that's one discussion we could have. That's an interesting discussion there. Would it have as much of an impact on uh, people behaving, merely behaving better? That's another discussion. Third would be, would it have as much of an impact on cultivating virtue, developing the virtues? That's a third possibility. Um, let me just say, you know, I'm throw up my hands. Uh, on, on the second and the third questions. You know, would it have as much of an impact? It, it's hard to say without uh, a lot of naturalistically acquired data. Uh, right now we have comparisons between say atheists and agnostics versus theists. That's not the same thing as uh, theists versus fictionalists. Comparing the behavior of uh, theists versus fictionalists who still believe in God, but in a fictionalized God. You know, what would the data show? Uh, we can do armchair, you know, a priori speculation if we want. I'd, I'd be happy to do that. But as far as uh, I, I want to ground this in, in data too, and I, we just don't, don't have that data. Mm -hmm. Yes, fair enough. But I guess that when I was referring to a sort of ideal or fictional being to which we attribute all the good moral traits that we can come up with, let's mm -hmm. say, uh, per perhaps I was thinking more in the sense of, uh, so let's say if we're trying to improve our moral character, we look toward the future to at least a version of us that has those sorts of characteristics ah. that we are trying to reach. So, I, I, I mean, the, does does that make sense? It does. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, I think that's that's nicely weaves together a number of our themes too. Uh, so, you know, on the empirical grounds, we know that most of us, are, at least myself included, are not virtuous. On philosophical and, if you want to say, religious grounds too. We should try to become virtuous, and we see a picture of what being virtuous looks like, and then we think, well, what is going to be helpful to bridge the gap, to try and help bring us closer to this ideal of ourselves, of what a virtuous person would look like, and in, in particular, what my virtuous self would look like. And there, uh, you know, it might matter quite a bit whether it's a there's a fictional divine being versus an actual divine being, if it's an actual divine being who might take steps to help us bridge that gap. 
if it's a div actual divine being who's distant, who's a deistic being who doesn't care about us, who just created the universe and then was hands off, you know, not not so much of an impact. But if it's an actual divine being who is cares about us and also wants to provide us with means or uh, you know tools or assistance to help us bridge that gap, well then, if there really is such a being, <laughs> I think that could matter. And believing, which is what, what your question was about, believing that there is such a divine being could also be a, have a psychological benefit in uh, closing that gap as well. So now I think I did a better job of uh, di speaking directly to what you were asking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we really have to go, Dr. Miller. So just before we go, would you like perhaps to tell people, uh, apart from your books, what are some of the best online places for them to get in touch with more of your work and perhaps you will you would also like to include something about the character project great great yeah um so let me say that first uh, the character product was a product we developed here at wake forest funded by the john templeton foundation where we studied character from the perspectives of philosophy psychology and theology we funded 28 scholars around the world and gave a lot of support to their research products, and they made fascinating discoveries, which you can learn more about. And then we did our own research here at Wake Forest too. And some of that research was precisely what we talked about today. The, the books that I wrote all stem from the Character Project. So you can learn more about the Character Project by going to www.thecharacterproject.com. Uh, my research can be found at my website. Um, so that's easy, just go to Google and uh, Google Christian Miller, and I come up right away. Uh, also, I'm on social media and Facebook and at Twitter, where there you would want to look for Character Gap. Um, so not not my name, but on Twitter and Facebook, it's Character Gap. So thank you for the chance to to mention that. And I would encourage uh, listeners and, and viewers to interact with those resources, and I'd be happy to answer questions too. Mm -hmm. Sure. I will be leaving all of that in the description box of this video for people to go and check it out if they are interested in it. And so, Dr. Miller, again, I would like to thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It was a very interesting conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Thank you a lot for watching this interview until the end and also, by the way, for coming to my channel. Uh, as you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep this channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge. Any amount, even if just one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelina, Jim Frank, Francis Ford and Hans Frederick Sunda. Thank you for all.